Hello, uh, welcome to London Kurdish Film Festival Global Edition. We are celebrating our 20 years and it is our uh, 12th edition. It is a global edition and I am joined by Asla Erdoğan. We are going to talk about the film that she's been participating in. It, the title called Zehra and Others. So basically it is a, a woman film for women and it is very interesting. So uh, one of the actors here is uh, Asla Erdoğan. She's the writer, author of eight books, translated into 20 languages. She's been a colonist. She is a human rights defender, ex-political prisoner, and also she has uh, she's been working in the you know particle uh, physicist area as well. But she's uh, mainly known for her writing. And thank you very much, Asli, for participating in this uh, Q&A. So I'm really pleased that um, you made time for us, that we can talk about the film yourself and also the cinema in general and Kurdish cinema. How are you? How are you doing in this uh, pandemic? How does it you know, affect your life or work these days? Well, I would... I don't want to start with a lie, but my life is uh, is hell. <laughs> I'm uh, a few. I think only two months after I moved to Berlin, the pandemic came, so I got caught up in a city I don't know. And then in June, I was diagnosed a very dangerous autoimmune disease. Yes. Uh, in fact, a fatal disease. So I'm facing the pandemic with an autoimmune disease. So that's really a very nasty situation. I So it's been a health, really. My life here last year has been a health, I must confess. And it's not like a UK. I think in UK you have overcome the worst part. But in Germany still, it's uh, we are in the third wave. Yeah. And it, People are losing hope. I can see everyone is angry, tense, nervous, anxious. Uh, it's a difficult time. Now that, uh, you know, almost all of us um, uh, had to stay, you know, indoors, um, did that have an, any effect on your work? You know, I know that you like to be lonely as well. <laughs> you know, you're a social person, but in the meantime, you don't mind being alone, you know, all your life. I can see that, you know, yeah. um, it is helping you to do all this great work. So um, have you been more creative during this pandemic or? Well, I must confess, loneliness has been my most dependable partner, let's say, the longest partner in my life. But, uh, and I'm used to being at home. Uh, I'm an ex-prisoner, so maybe compared to some other people, I take it more easily. Uh, but even for me, I, I was very depressed. I mean, I was far too depressed to work. So time to time, I put myself a bit of discipline and put myself to some routines. But then I fall off again, so it's uh, it's not really easy. Okay. Uh, and also being in exile, you yeah. know, being separa separated from your loved ones, you know, yes. the envir yes. environment that, you know, you was born and raised. Yeah, and, and, I, um, and I'm in exile, plus I, I had never lived in Berlin. So the pandemic came, I didn't even know the next street. I had just moved here, so it is really a horrible con po position. position. And and on top of it, I, I have a learned I have a fatal disease. Uh, so it, and it's you know in exile, it means that you will um, not have a chance to go home. That is really a heavy blow. So it is. Uh, I mean, exile is very difficult. I I don't know if you have experienced it yourself. Uh, well, I do. Yeah, I'm I'm in exile in a way. <laughs> so you That's know, it is it is not like being a tourist or being like an expatriate. Or if if there is one place in the world you cannot go, 
the rest of the world turns into a big prison. And uh, and for a writer, the worst part is that I'm exiled from my language. My I rarely hear Turkish. Uh, so I think my, yeah, that, that, that's a that's a very important topic that uh, I do like to um, you know talk about uh, um, in, in a bit. Let's talk yeah. about the you know the title, the film. Um, and then we can go on about language, which is very important, I mean, for yourself and for myself. Now, uh, your native language is Turkish, mine is yes. Kurdish, but mm -hmm. I, I wasn't able to, you know, learn my language, you know, to study know. my own language. And then... A so actually, actually, I'm not an ethnic Turk. I come from two different ethnic groups. Uh, uh, my father is a Czechist, Circassian, for example. My mother is from Thessaloniki, so I I have to have lost several languages on the way. But my native tongue is Turkish, so that is in a way my only tie to Turkey. Uh, my only country is is my language, and I do understand very well. I mean, this this pain of losing your own language and uh, yeah. And I, I think, I think it, yeah, yeah it, it's a really important topic to talk it's, about. It's extremely important. It's yeah. everything. It's your soul. Your native language is your soul. It's if you are broken from it, you are broken lifetime. I think. Yes, um, uh, you know, as a as a writer, you've been very productive, and your you know um, uh, writings, your books, your stories. Um, is uh, known very well known internationally and it's been translated into different languages so we don't have problems with you know uh, having and speaking other languages say for instance you know you're able to speak very well uh, english so i'm trying to speak english as well so yes. for the, the purpose of audience you know to understand us that's mm -hmm. the reason why we chose but now mm -hmm. uh, we will we will come a term you know to see how we feel about you know our language uh, if we don't learn our own language, what happened to us, you know, to really uh, explain this to the audience. And so that way, Kurdish cinema and Kurdish films would be uh, received, um, uh, you know, informally. And uh, audience will know, you know, how Kurds are feeling, you know, being in exile, you know, the banned languages, you know, yeah. uh, destroyed, you know, histories, historicals being yeah. taught, you know, a, a, a history that is not true to them. So anyway, yeah. let's talk about the film. So this yeah. film is about three uh, women. So yeah. Zehra Doğan uh, is the, um, she's a journalist and a painter artist. So uh, she's been into prison for yeah. the reason why you've been in prison too as well. Yeah. So the other, the other character is Shabnam Korofin Janja. She's the forensic physician. So um, she got in trouble because she did the Jizre report, yeah. and you got you got in trouble because you was writing the things that happening in Jizre. Yes, I, I think uh, uh, because can I us, can you tell us your crime? You know <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? You know well, to be sentenced a life sentence and then to be jailed yeah, for hundred and thirty two I mean, days. It was, in fact, um, a, quite a dramatic uh, court because, I, as far as I know, I'm probably the first female writer in the entire Turkish history to be asked such a heavy sentence. Me and Nejmi Alpay, we were both asked uh, aggravated life, which is the replacement of death sentence. And the only reason they showed with it file was opened because we are on the advisory board of Özgür Kinder. But we have been on this... It's a, it's a pro kurdish newspaper, right? Yeah, and, but it's a totally legal newspaper. And we have been on the advisory board for five years. And the Turkish press law is very clear. Advisory board has no legal responsibility over the paper. It's just advisors. And they know that so well, for five years, none of the court cases against the newspaper was reflected to us. 
It was a totally symbolic board of a writer, a linguist, a publisher, a feminist, uh, only one HDP member, and he wasn't charged even. I think the whole case was actually, honestly, prepared for me. They wanted to put me in jail and they looked and they looked and they looked and they suddenly said, oh, she's on the advisory board. And I think I thought about this. Why are they so angry at me? I mean, I was not a very uh, political writer. I was not famous as a political figure. There were many thousands of people who did much more for cause of Kurdish rights in general or human rights in, in general and Kurdish rights in particular. Why me? I think to, I could find two reasons. One, I wrote about Jizre, and I wrote quite well. I wrote very, very powerful two literary texts, which also got published in Norway. This is one thing that made can you, them... Can you, can you quickly remind us what was happening in Jizre? Because in, oh. in the documentary, there, there are lots of you know information about this. Uh, it says uh, in the documentary that 143 people burned to death in Jizre basement. At least, yeah. at least, at, at least. least. Yeah, because these people, I mean, Jizre was not the only place. Several places got uh, severely surrounded by the army, by the military, with civilians inside. I saw, I witnessed Sur in the early days. I entered Sur, but it wasn't at the later stages, it was the September of 2015. And I saw with my own eyes what they were so, doing. So you, you went there to witness what was going on? Yeah, even in the early stages, I witnessed all the, you know, the civilians were shot at, there were bullet holes and the holes caused by heavy artillery in the, in the hospital. <laughs> I mean, it was so apparent that a big massacre is starting. Uh, they were shooting at every, every, everything moving. They didn't care it's uh, someone with guns, a child, a woman. Oh, it, it, was, it was like war scenes. And that was just beginning the September. And I left, I went back to Poland in 2015. I was living in Poland. And I gave one interview at Sur. This is, I think, uh, what really got on Mr. Erdogan's nerves uh, because he said a few comments. And then I came back. Most of the atrocities had already taken place, but Jizre was still there, beginning of 2016. And people okay. were... That, that column that you write or the story, was it a specific story or was you describing what was going on there? Well, uh, what I did was, uh, I used a literary technique actually, which I learned from an Austrian poet and it's very powerful. I, uh, I did a lot of reading on concentration camps and Holocaust and I, some people say there can't be poetry after Holocaust, but there are also others who try to make literature out of that. And this poet has written a bo book of poetry by taking quotes, mostly from official documents. You know, these documents have a very cold, bloodless language. The first time I read it, I said, what is this? The second time it hit me. And then I tried it with uh, Soma, this big accident where 300 uh, miners died. Just took quotes from autopsy reports, from their last letters, last phone calls, sentence, little sentences. And the effect was really incredible. Everybody called me, I cried reading your article, what did you do? But it, it, it's not easy, actually, because there are thousands of sentences you can choose from. You have to choose a hundred. 
But if you are experienced with this technique, really, it, everybody who read my Jizra articles fell into a big crying <laughs> fit. Yeah. But this is a method. It's not, you know, my talent. I, I worked on it. And what I did, and I, I also see you're using metaphors actually to describe. No, 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 no metaphors. Precise, true sentences from autopsy reports, okay. for phone calls. Uh, I mean, there is not a single sentence of mine that makes the technique more powerful. I'm totally absent. Okay. But it has to be done very carefully. I mean, it took me one month. You have to really choose very well to create the effect. I started with the autopsy report of uh, Dr. Uh, Shebnem. Shebnem. This autopsy report helped me a lot. And it shows clearly that there was, because they found in one of these basements, only a handful of bones. Out of all oh, these... Remember that, that there were children as well. Yes, and this autopsy report proved it, that one of the bones out of these 100 people remained a handful of bones. I don't know how they burned them with what, but one of the bones belonged to a 12-year-old child. The autopsy report was a strict evidence. So I started with the autopsy report. Then I took a line from one of the phone calls. These people made phone calls even to the European Parliament. Save us. We are, they are burning us. And then after that, I put uh, the line from the wife of the guy who did this phone call. Her husband is dead now. And finally, I finished with the sentence I took from a newspaper. A young girl is speaking. She said, they gave me a plastic bag full of ashes and bones. And they said, this is your father. This was the title of the article. This is your father. And this was really, I think, one of the best articles I've ever written. Because, first of all, I avoided putting my own sentences because the situation was so tragic. I didn't want to make literature out of that. Okay. But on the other hand, I had to use a literary technique to bring out the full tragedy of what's happening. And third, I was also afraid of being arrested. So <laughs> I didn't lie, write my, that's why they couldn't charge me on that article. Because there is not a single sentence of mine. Yeah, I, I remember in one of your uh, interview, you're saying you read the uh, journalism, you know, law, and you made sure that you understand, you digest every bit. That's yeah. why you've been trying to protect yourself too. But you want to talk about the truth too. Yes, I mean, but that was back in when I was a columnist in Radical. I took it very seriously and I read the press law very well. And that's how I, none of my articles have been charged before. You see, this is almost a miracle in Turkey. I touched many taboos, <laughs> but I know the press law. But the problem is in since last six years or so, there is no law in Turkey. There is no so law. This, uh, this uh, uh, called, uh, you know, um, attempted coup in 2016, yeah. uh, back in July, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. And I got arrested one month after that. And I mean, oh, Turkey was a big arrest factory. It was like junta years. I, mean, I saw hundreds of people waiting in the... Uh, halls of the court building to be arrested. Hundreds sitting on the ground, young men, probably soldiers. I mean, like a concentration camp. It was, oh, that was a very, part, very bad time. They, there was mass arrests of everybody. Even the policemen were arrested. They were sent to arrest other people. They came home to find 
their friends to take them to to prison. I mean, it was really a very very hectic time, and so many people went under the. <laughs> you know, they had nothing basically, but hundred tens of thousands of people were arrested for either PKK, FETA, PKK, FETA, or, or both. So what, what was your charge? I mean, what, what crime did you actually commit that <laughs> to, to be to your house to be raided? And then, you know, you're talking about, you know, many soldiers with heavy arms, you know, yeah. uh, coming to your home and taking you and then uh, you was in prison for 132 days and then uh, for, so for, 46 no was 46. it 136 136 36. okay yeah so yeah. Uh, b- before we touch on that uh, when did you become familiar with uh, what was happening to kurdish people so did did you have any friends yeah. like back in well, your early it's, uh, age not really. I'm from Istanbul and I have a diff- very different uh, ethnic background. And I have to confess, you know, the Turkish education system and on top of it, the Turkish mass media uh, is ba- built on hiding what's done to, tur- to Kurds. I come from a leftist family. My father was a Circassian, so he should be more sensitive to other ethnic groups. But honestly, I did not know much until, and in the 90s, I was also abroad. I was the first in, at CERN as a physicist, then in Brazil. So the, the bloody 90s, I, I, I was not there. Uh, but when I started my columnist work in Radical, I started to write about prisons and torture. Um, and, so you not, know, not, not, not necessarily the you know Kurdish prisoners. No, 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 prisoners not at all. Prisoners in oh. general, and uh, more political prisoners, and more women. And I think uh, what brought uh, my first article that touched the Kurdish issue, and I think it was one of my best articles ever written. Some articles I write with feeling, and I oh. they are good. Uh, they, I know, I, I myself, you know, end up three days in bed after writing such an article. I had the cases, so a friend brought me a little file of six women, young women, let's say children, because they were all under 18, Kurdish, and raped by Korujus, paramilitary, let's say. And in one case was probably military itself. So let let let's let's say what this is. So in Turkey, basically, Kurdish people in their village they've been uh, offered money to take this job and to actually yeah. uh, give information about their own people. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they they are given very good guns, and in the, in those areas. Uh, a good gun is everything. They have absolute power. And there, I'm sure it was not just six cases of rape. It was yeah. much bigger, but it was covered. And everything was against these girls. This, it is 90s. The society was not really ready to talk about rape. Within 10 years, it became more open. And especially those areas. So the, I was going to touch three taboos, rape, children's rape, Kurdish taboo, and military on the courage. And I, I, I chose three of these cases because one column is very small. And I used a technique, again, a sort of literary technique. I just took a few lines from the news, the files, and then I wrote a very literary paragraph in contrast to it of my own experience because I've been raped as well. And I went like that, interchanging languages, and in the end I finished with the one sentence. She was 15 years old. First time I went to 
past tense. And she was mentally retarded. And the autopsy report said rape by a uh, bayonet. This article fell like an axe, really. I mean, I knew it because I got my first death threat that day. You know, okay. I had oh, unknown sources. Guess who? <laughs> Guess who? <laughs> who is who can it be? I mean, and yeah, the article was powerful. Um, and then one of these young ladies whom I wrote about, she wanted to meet me. And we arranged a meeting. This is how it all started, you know. Then I started to meet more Kurdish, let's say, victims, because I met generally people who were the families of prisoners. I start. I my eyes opened. I mean, I I was so blind to you know. I knew the Kurds were oppressed and everything theoretically, but what was really happening there? Oh my God! It's like I looked at the cases of the losses, the missing thousands, torture cases, thousands. The Arbakir prison. You know, once you open a door. The next followed, but, and I, yeah, the story unfolded itself, isn't it? Yes, and I I realized that there is still more that I do not know, and I I decided that this is the most tragic situation in Turkey. This has to be dealt with. I, I'm talking of prisons and of women's and of women issues, but without talking about the Kurds, all is left on the surface. This is at the center of everything I decided uh, and tried to learn. Uh, of course, it was not so easy because I'm not a Kurd, I don't speak Kurdish. I learned a bit in prison, uh, but I tried to cover, make up for my losses. I read about Kurdish history and all this and all that. So, and then of course, it happened in 2015, 2016, and things became almost as bad as 90s, if not worse. And I thought I had to write, and uh, actually people warned me, don't write about Jizre. Don't. <laughs> this is a, it is, Turkey uh, will yes, not let yes. it. Since, since that day, still, people that did this, you know, the authorities that did this and committed all these crimes, they're not being charged. So No, he, that, but that has always been like that. In the 90s too, there, was, there were so many atrocities and no, almost nobody was charged. Once in a while, if someone was taken to court, he was acquitted, or even if he got a sentence, they let him out very quickly. I mean, charges against women in Turkey generally go with very little punishment. But for Kurds, it's almost the norm. I mean, it's it's really so hopeless to wait justice from the court system, especially these days. I mean, oh, and I've seen it myself with my own eyes. I've seen the judicial system and the prison system. It's really racist. You but are treated... Uh, hmm? this, remember, this practice is not only um, at the you know near future that is happening. It's not only uh, Erdogan or his uh, you know uh, ruling course. party doing this. If you look at you know the at least a hundred years of you know Turkish yes. Republic, you are very right. You, you, you can see all the massacres. And what is interesting is, with my experience, say for instance, I had like uh, friends from university, like twenty years, thirty years friends. As soon as I start to talk about, you know, Kurdish issues and what was happening, they're gone. They, I they, know. Don't, they, don't, want, they don't want to hear. They, they, they pretend like nothing is happening. I just really want to understand this. It doesn't matter. I mean, you're inflicting a pain, you're killing, you know, a human being. It doesn't matter who, who they are. And this is, this is happening over a thousand years. 
and still in Turkey, we cannot raise the awareness in the, uh, you know, Kurdish people, uh, Turkish people. They don't want to see that. Why do we think, you know, do they want to just close and that they don't want to hear what's happening or do they just, well, want, is, it, is it a survival thing? Well, I, I think you ask me, what is your crime? I think my first crime, my original what, sin was that I was quite a well-known writer, a respected writer of literature, not a bestseller, when I chose to write for Özgür Gündem. And I'm not a Kurd. This is a big crime in Turkey. Why on earth does she write for this paper? Why does she, is she so interested in the Kurds while we are not? I think also my other crime was also to touch another taboo, which is the Armenian genocide. Now, I think there's a connection. The Turkish Republic, I think, when it was form formulated, founded, it had to create a nation from a collapsing empire of at least 30 to 60 ethnicities. They had to build up Turkish nationalism. In fact, it was quite fictional. There is almost nobody really Turkish in Turkey. So but how did they do it? They did it at the expense of the Armenians, the Greeks, the Assyrians. Then came the turn of Circassians, which were totally assimilated because they were small in number. Kurds, they were very big in number. It was not so easy to assimilate them. But is it, is it because there's a population maybe over 25 million? Yeah, in, uh, North I Turkey? think yes. I think if Turkey, if Kurds were like us, if you were only one and a half million, you too would be totally massacred or assimilated. But Kurds were the indigenous people of the land, and they were big in numbers. But Turkish Republic, let's say, tried. I mean, there is 1930s, there is the Dersim, the Zaza Kurds, there are Turkish, Turkish history is full of massacres, and so is the Ottoman history. Okay, we can forgive Ottomans in a way because, you know, at those ages, they knew no other ways or means. But I think it's the, I mean, the, the Turkish Republic, if you look at it as a building, in the basement, there are corpses. There are the corpses of Armenians and Greeks. And this Republic built itself on denying of that. So, of course, since then, it will deny everything else to it, just no, more than denying, it always accuses the other side. The Armenians attacked us. The Greeks invaded us. The Kurds are terrorists. It's always the Turks are the most innocent people in the world. This is the, the foundation of the Turkish Republic, actually. And if you try to question it, yes, you get very strange responses from even top intellectuals. I mean... I was very much disliked by literary circles for the simple reason that I wrote once in a while for Özgür Gündem. I mean, it's... I mean, it was, yeah. I mean, why, why are they like that? I mean, when I look at even, you know, um, we are reading uh, famous uh, poets, uh, you know, the, the, like Turkish poets, they can talk about maybe uh, a bomb that uh, <laughs> in in Japanese, but they don't mm. want to see what's happening to Kurds. They've been bombarded. They've been killed. You know, there are acid acid wells that people killed and yeah. put it there, and people are killed in the in the street. Even you know, with bare with any clothes, you know, just yeah. in the street, and yeah. then that people are not being collected from that. And there's always curfew, and there's always you know bans. So I don't understand as a human being. Say for instance, as the, you know in literature, I don't see anything that actually talk about what's happening there. 
I mean, why? But very is, it right. a, is it a guilty conscience? What, what is it? I think it's the matter of identity. I think it is the Turkish identity is built in such a way that they take it as a threat, even if you mention the word Armenian or a Kurd. I, I was treated horribly because of this letter of apology to Armenians. I was thrown out of cafes in Istanbul. It's not only the Kurdish but the issue. The two big taboos that most majority of Turks, even the leftists, get really take it as an offense to their identity, if you mention these. And it, it, is a, it is a kind of schizophrenia in a way, because this is our reality. And you have to confront your own reality if you want to grow up. And in that way, the Turkish children, the Turkish people are behaving, I think, majority of them, little children. They don't want to listen. They don't want to learn. Uh, if you try to talk, they leave. And there are so many, so many documents about Armenians. Nobody reads them. And, uh, yeah, this But also, is... you know, the education system as well. It yeah, is of actually, course. Yeah, it, it is actually um, given, uh, like, wrong information. And also, they, they are making, like, a, uh, army people. Even when you go to school, you have to say certain yeah. things. Yeah, the you military. You have to say 24 speech. hours that you're Turk, you're this, you're that. You have to, yes. you know, um, you, you, you don't talk about your own identity. Uh, and well, they're raising, they are raising it. How is the education system uh, has an effect, you know, on people that, you know, they deny? I mean, the ordinary people don't want to see the truth. Well, honestly, two years ago, I just said a few lines in an interview with an Italian journalist. I told him that uh, our education system is uh, nationalistic and militaristic, and it always teaches us that there is an enemy out there. And in two weeks, some campaign grew against me. It became a TT. I got socially lynched. Over one million people cursed me and my mother. So I was taken under police custody, in, uh, police uh, protection in Germany. Just because I said this very simple fact that Turkish education system is nationalistic and militaristic. They lynched me. They, I mean, thousands of death threats. And then I replied back, I said, look, first there was a translation error. This was, but they knew it was a translation error. They still kept on. And I said, look, how do you dare to say you don't hate Kurds if you hate even me? I mean, this is a very big proof what you are capable of doing. You say you will kill me. So how do you believe that you are innocent of killing Kurds and Armenians? You want even to kill this little woman who little, little criticized. I mean, I, this, this is them. Yeah, if you say Turkish education system is militaristic, they re reply back, we will kill you whore. They prove everything I say by their reactions. Everything they do, their reactions actually prove that of the atrocities this society and the state has been committing. That's it. I mean, uh, of course, the education system is at the core of it. It's a bit changed now, but when I was a child, we started the day with the national, what is it called? Turkim uh, Dorim uh, Çalışkanıma. I forgot the word in English that you have to say everything and you have to prove your loyalty to your Turkishness and Turkey and you give as a present your life to your country. I mean, it, like North Korea or something. I mean, it's it was really, yeah, we grew up with this Atatürk portraits in every classroom. Total fetishism of flag and Atatürk and all this. And, I, I, and you can see it in many Turks, even in Germany. There are 100 nations here, but only the Turks that go out onto the streets with big flags and they paint their cars with Tur 
red and white. What is this? What are we trying to prove? What is this fetishism about flag? What sort of complexes are behind this? It's, it's actually very, uh, very complicated sociological, political issue. Uh, and I, I do think that the education system is one of the central uh, things we have to really look at. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and also at home, if people don't have sources, you know, to learn the truth, uh, not about, I'm not talking about the, what is right, what is wrong. I'm talking about the truth. You know, truth always will sh show itself. Maybe it's, if it's not today, it is tomorrow. But uh, I'm interested in, you know, how, you know, families are raising their children, hating other, other people, you know, uh, why the ex existential is depending on, you know, killing other nations. I mean, uh, Kurdistan is a country, it's been there before Turks came. And then, you know, their homeland is being raided, not only in Bakuri, you know, Kurdistan in, in Turkey part, but, it, you know, in Syria, in uh, uh, Iraq, everywhere. Now Turkey, it's not enough to kill people in Turkey. <laughs> now they are raiding, you know, Afrin, you know, Syria. Yes. <laughs> They actually want to kill all Kurds. Wherever the Kurds are, they just want to get rid of them. I mean, I don't understand this mentality. They should be they should be in institution, I think. What do you think? Well, I think it's just this matter of identity and Turkey really sees Kurds as a threat to the Turkish identity. And this is a very uh, distorted, uh, in fact, reverted analysis of, of Turkey. Actually, Turkey is a threat to the Kurds, but they put it the other way around. Well, what happened with Germans and Jews? They said Jews are a big threat. There were only half a million Jews in Germany at, the, at its peak, but they said, oh, they are destroying us. But they were preparing to destroy them. This is a very common, uh, uh, maybe psychological tool to, you know, to justify hatred and justify killing. You have to see the other as a threat, even though he or she is not, not at all, nothing like that. But, you know, you have to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And yes, now most Turkish people think that if 10 Kurds come together in Syria, Turkey will collapse. I mean, they are really very afraid of Turkey being uh, broken into pieces or something. And I, I mean, it's paranoia, really. It's paranoia. I would say it's, it's not a very healthy look at why is Turkey so afraid of, for example, a federation or there are many countries with uh, federative systems, with cantons. Yeah. They are not breaking apart. They are living in peace. Uh, these things are possible to discuss at least. You can't even discuss them in Turkey. Yeah, if, if even at, uh, yeah, if you look at pro-Kurdish party, HDP now, you can see, you know, how they've been destroyed, how they've been yeah. put in prison, uh, you know, um, because they've been raising this issue in the parliament. So yeah. um, uh, let's look at the... Um, you know, right now, uh, nothing has changed. But if you compare, now everybody may be uh, accusing Erdogan. But if you compare, say, for instance, Atatürk to Erdogan, don't we see the same practice, you know, back 100 years ago and now? You know, all well, people that love Atatürk, they think that he's not a dictator. They think that he, he didn't kill, you know, Kurds, although it, it's happened really when he, he was ruling. So how, how do you see that? I mean, the same practice. You know, well, as, again as, I, again. as I said, I think the, the, it's in the foundation of the Turkish Republic, in the ideology of the creation of Turkish nation, and it's stronger than people. I, I mean, actually, the, it was born, I think, with the Jean Turks in Thessaloniki, yeah. in the center of Jewishness of that time. This was created. And actually, the, uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk came 
a bit later when the Armenian genocide had taken place. He was not at the center of things. I think this, this ideology is actually stronger and it will go on until it's been confronted. Whoever yes. comes, if it's Mustafa Kemal, Erdogan, this, this doesn't matter. This is the formation of Turkish Republic and it has all, all nationalisms should be confronted. Well, what, but we can't sort of, you know, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk lived in 30s, 1930s. It was a special era. There was Stalin, there was Mussolini, there was Hitler, there was Franco. We can't, I don't, I think it's a bit unfair to judge him with the concepts of today. Because after the Second World War, we all learned a lot. We learned bitter lessons about how to be more democratic and equalitarian and all this. For 19 in 30s, he was, you know, a medium kind of dictator, I would say. But for Erdogan, I don't think we can give the same excuses because he came to the power with the claim that he will democratize Turkey. Yeah, this was his first and most important uh, rhetoric, and Turkish people in the beginning of this millennium were very uh, Turkish, by, I mean the people of Turkey, we were all very thirsty for democracy. It was yes. a society opening up. It was a society learning to speak up. It was a society learning to confront. It was just opening up. And Erdogan came with these hopes. And then, whoop, he shut everything back again and he used this historically very strong state to his advantage. He used everything. I don't think he really cares so much about ideologies or this or Kurds or Turks or this. I think all he wants is power. This is my own little judgment. And of course, I mean, in Turkey, I think HDP, HDP is not only a pro-Kurdish part, it's a feminist party, it's an ecologist party, it's I think the only party in Turkey with a democratic, really democratic program. And this of course, Erdogan cannot allow basically. He wants absolute power and the HDP is the only party that stands against this absolute power with a democratic program. So with all his forces, he went on to HDP. I, well, I was in prison every day, suddenly started coming in several members of HDP. Uh, and when uh, Figan Yüksekta and um, Selahattin, Demirtaş. Selahattin Demirtaş was were arrested, I was in prison. I remember that period very well. I mean, they, in a few months, they collected everybody from HDP, top level to bottom level, and they kept on and on and on and on. And if you remember in 2015, actually, there was one big night of pogrom, uh, which the Turkish press you know, replied with its usual silence, where they burned almost all the HDP buildings in Turkey. It wasn't yeah. really a pogrom. I mean, the Kurds were attacked and beaten on the streets. And again, silence. <laughs> I mean, we have our crystal now. So, so you, don't, you don't see any reaction from other opposition parties, you see. So or yeah. when, it comes to, when it comes to Kurdish issue, they are all together. When it comes to invading a Kurdish land, they, they are all on the same page. I mean, why? why? Well, I put in that Jizre article also one little quotation from uh, a newspaper, maybe Huriet yeah. was it. It was a, just a little uh, sign a woman was carrying in, uh, in the western part of Turkey uh, to a football game. And she's very probably Kemalist from CHP, so she's an oppositionary. Yes. 
And the sign said, Bodrum'da mutlu son. Happy ending in the basement. Basement. I think this tells everything. The, the 143 people are burned and she's happy about it. Oh, uh, I mean, that's, that, 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 that will tell you the story. You yeah, know, you, you become spe thing. speechless. In fact, you almost become speechless. Uh, what kind of hatred is that? Okay, yes. she, she believes they were terrorists. They were not, they were civilians. But let's say they were terrorists. How could you be happy? I can't, I, I, I hate Daesh. But if some people put 143 Daesh members in a basement and burn them, I possibly cannot feel happy. They are human beings. I want them yes. to be caught alive <laughs> and taken yes. to court. Uh, how could one be happy? This is like, a, like a, you know. That's, the, that's the problem. I mean, Kurdish people, they don't even have a uh, value of an ant, maybe a cat, you know, a living thing. Do you understand? You know, that, that's why, um, you know, in, in your writing, you're trying to maybe, I don't know, I'm going to ask you, what are you trying to, to do in your writing? Are you trying to, you know, liberate women? Are you trying to raise um, and empower women? Are you trying to raise, you know, the issues in the uh, global uh, audience? Uh, what is your motive of writing? Is, are you writing for yourself? Uh, I mean, you're, you're well, a very let's sensitive say person. It's a it's a very long answer, but I'm basically a writer of literature. I did a little columnist work altogether three, four years. In my literature work, literary work, I'm writing basically to serve up, or let's say to put some meaning into the into life, right. into words, into concepts, uh, because it's so void of meaning the whole world I see, and I want it to have a bit of meaning. In my columnist work, I, I, all, I didn't actually separate it from literature. I think you, you, if you are really keen about literature, you can do it in a newspaper too, in yeah. 4,000 characters. But in columnist writing, I try to have also the responsibility of, let's say, a doctor, because it is not for... Uh, book prizes for this, for that. I'm writing about real people, real tragedies. I, I have to be as careful as a doctor. And what is the purpose of writing about all this? Well, I think I always believe that story of the victim has to be told. I, if, am I capable of that? I don't know, but I'm at least trying at least in cases where the victim is, is not able to or has more limitations than I am. I have to step and try. And I'm not writing for an audience, let's say, for Europeans, for this, for that. I have lost hope, actually, in most of the audience. I'm writing for a perhaps imaginary conscience. Maybe if, it, if it's not there, maybe I will help to build it. I want people to feel sorry if someone is burned in a basement, as simple as that. That's it, conscience. Uh, whoever has it, is it French, is it European, it is Native American, it's Turkish, I don't care. I do want to believe in some human essence that we share that this is a tragedy that should not be allowed. This is a crime to burn a 12-year-old child in a basement. And we are part of this crime. This is what I want to tell people, actually. We are participating in this crime one way or the other. And, uh, and I think this yeah, is the... Yeah. yeah, in one of your interviews, you're saying... Erdogan is one of us, really. So yeah, yeah he grew it. up in Turkey. He's been raised that way. So yes, and he's a very good representative of Turkish society. That's why he's so popular, or he was. 
It is his us. We created him. We look into the mirror. We see ourselves. I mean, uh, he didn't come from Mars or he didn't come yeah. from Norway. He's very typically Kasim Pasha creation. I mean, <laughs> he's um, amazing in that way. You know? And that's why he's so appealing to people. He's one of yeah. them. He's one of them. Uh, much more than me, perhaps. I, I'm much more a foreigner to most of the Turkish public when I say conscience and things like that. <laughs> they look at me, is she, is she a stupid, is she totally an idiot or something, or a terrorist, that's what uh, they finally described me as. And uh, Yeah, I understand. I mean, you, <laughs> it's uh, we, we need good people, actually. We need peace. So you are actually doing a very good job. And not only well, for Kurdish people, you know, to raise the, that consciousness and awareness. And especially uh, you've been doing this for women as well. So I can see yes. that, you know, that there's lots of human rights violations in Turkey and in other parts of the, you know, world. And there's Kurdish people rights, there's women rights. So you've been actually looking at those because as women, actually, uh, maybe later on we'll talk about, you know, how, uh, who is dominating all these politics, maybe cinema, and how this world is unfolding, you know, with the power of men ruling the system. Well, I think the, if there is one issue that is even more complicated than the Kurdish issue or racism, or this, I think it's the inequality of genders. I think it is the very first discrimination the human being created, man oppressed the woman. And it's the most deeply rooted. A good 10,000 years, I would estimate, the man has been oppressing the woman. And so we have to really, really fight very hard against it, I might I say. I, I, it will not change from one decade to the other. It's very deeply rooted. In every man and in every woman, the seeds of this discrimination is there. I, I do believe that. I mean, uh, in any field, I worked as a physicist. I worked, uh, I'm a writer of literature. I meet many writers, many critics. No, if you are a woman writer, don't expect to be taken as seriously as men. Maybe in one or two countries, Sweden or Norway, you might be a bit luckier, but no, always and always in the eyes of the man, we are suspicious. Our talents are suspicious. We are all kind of a second class. And this is so deeply rooted that they are not even aware of it. Women are not aware of it. how they actually treat the woman around them and inside them. So I, I am also very keen on that uh, because I'm a directly and I'm directly victim of it. I mean, I mean, especially in Turkey nowadays, it's been you know some years that uh, in the streets women are you get killed by the husband, by the brother, yeah, because they they, they want to they because they've been separated or you know, um, yeah. you can see that uh, you know whoever committed that crime they've not been jailed properly, they've not been punished, you know. They can be yeah. um, released. I mean, whereas if you look at uh, now, uh, uh, Ahmed Altan has been released. He's one of the writers as well. What would you like to say, you know, the um, the treatment of the government towards, you know, writers or the people that raise in issues? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, Ahmed Altan was shortly ar uh, arrested after me, two weeks. And uh, he spent a very long time in jail. Yeah, it's four years and four yeah. years and six months. Yeah, and he's also at a, you know, he's over seventy. Yeah. Now, so I think it's it's very cruel. I think he was arrested for personal uh, grudge of yeah of the of Erdogan uh, and. This is just very unfair. I mean, and, um, and he is an important writer of Turkish literature. 
He's a very important journalist. I don't accept, I agree with all his ideas, uh, but I do accept that he's a very important columnist, maybe the best in the last decades. He's a very good novelist. So this man should be, should have been treated with much more respect. You like his ideas, you, I, you, you agree, but people should not be jailed for their ideas. If you don't like someone's idea, you ag- argue back. Yes. Uh, and this is the very basic of everything. But someone gets angry at a writer and the writer goes to jail. I mean, this is really uh, is it North Korea, I say. Even Russia is better in that sense. I mean, that uh, Putin doesn't put writers in jail as easily as Turkey does. Uh, not only writers, the journalists as well. I mean, oh, the journalists, many more, many more. Of course, writers are kind of in a way luckier because none of the prosecutors read literature and writers do not get right. in. <laughs> well, writers do not get into trouble until they are associated with press. But most of us are. Almost every writer in Turkey, one part or the other in her or his life has, has to do columnist work. Almost everybody. Maybe Orhan Pamuk is the only exception. All writers write for papers. This is how we earn money. Plus, the political situation generally has a sense of urgency. We can't. It, it is. It is. It is, it is not silent. necessarily that. It is not necessarily you know writers or journalists. They want to do politics. They want to inform people. You know about what's happening, and you get in trouble. It doesn't matter. Especially, you know, Kurdish issue is, is, a, yeah. is a red line. Is a red line, so you cannot talk about that. So that's why you can be punished. So there are lots of journalists, Kurdish journalists. Yeah, many more. I mean, for journalism, I mean, it, it is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. I, I think to be a journalist, a real journalist in Turkey, especially if you work for the leftist papers or the Özgür Gündem, everybody. Everybody gets arrested eventually and with very heavy sentences. Uh, I mean, imagine this. You might have heard this helicopter. They threw out yeah. of the helicopter two Kurdish villagers. Yeah. One died. The other was in a critical condition. I don't know his. Yeah. Which condition. And the judge. Ju- yeah. Yeah. The, the so, journalists who wrote that, who reported that, were arrested. Yeah. I mean, this is the extent of how, how things have deteriorated in Turkey. It's every journalist's job to write this. If someone is thrown out of a helicopter, you write it. No, the police didn't arrest the, the soldiers. They yeah. went on and straight arrested the journalists. And this has become the norm every time. I mean, the, for the Kurdish journalists, Turkey is, is a hell. And I, I really do appreciate these people, how courageous they are. They keep still working and they know they will be arrested. They will receive huge sentences. I mean, arrest is not the big thing in Turkey. Yeah. The, the important thing is these sentences. People get sentenced from 20 years to 50 years sometimes. Even lifetime. Yeah, lifetime is the new fashion. Yeah, lifetime, aggravated life. They give it as like, you know, passing little uh, candies. Lollies. Yeah, candies, lollies. Lifetime <laughs> and a- aggravated life. Thousands of people received aggravated life sentences. I mean, oh, it's really, really horrible. It's uh, And I saw in prison there was one girl, of course, Kurdish, she received 33 years for joining an illegal demonstration. 33 years. She is 22. I mean, you just can't believe it. 33 years to a 22-year-old girl. And then most people do not know about this. The Turkish press doesn't write. The European press doesn't write. They just write who's arrested and who's released. Right? But you have it's to just, follow. Yeah. yeah, it's just numbers. I I don't understand this. Say, for instance, even European 
uh, you know, journalists and people that actually are aware of this, why don't, don't they want to write about it? I mean, they all know. I mean, all the governments know. They, I mean, we understand they have uh, given and buying, uh, you know, things from each other. They, they just want to trade. They don't want to talk about human rights. Uh, we understand that. But how about the free press? Uh, you know? Well, uh, I mean, uh, we sh I don't want to be unfair because in my case and in cases of many journalists, especially like Denis Yücel, who are the German Turks, the German press was very active. Uh, but but I think they are they're weak. They're, yeah, they, they are, are doing only for individuals, you see. Not yes, they, they that's don't see it. the big picture. Yes, they don't and they can't and they, you know, to see the big picture is not very easy. You have to really be there. And I don't know, maybe they also um, don't want to see perhaps. I mean, it's um, especially after the pandemic started, I realized that there is much less interest in the others. People yeah. became more and more selfish, every, with maybe a survival instinct. And perhaps also they became a bit bored because one case, two case, three cases, but then hundreds people are bored, actually. It's always the same thing coming from Turkey. Uh, so if the press stops writing about these things, they assume it is over. But it's not. It's actually continuing. Yeah. Um, so I think we have a responsibility here, actually, to try to speak more about what is actually happening. And it's not just one or two individuals or this or that. It's a systematic problem. Yeah. Now, yeah, now that we talk about, you know, journalism, um, As Asli, you know, uh, the main character, you know, the film is, is about Asli Erdogan, and then, uh, sorry, it's about um, uh, the painter, you know, the Kurdish painter, and you are three characters that uh, that you guys all talk about your, your experience, you know, in the jail, and also the, how you've been treated. You know, you, you guys are three prominent activists, and you all, you know, facing with terrorism charges, and uh, some yeah. of the cases are still pending. And yeah. uh, mine too <laughs> is pending. Uh, you know, why why did you want to participate in this film, uh, Asla? How have you been asked you know, to be part of this uh, uh, film? And uh, I, I do like to thank you actually because it's very powerful. You know, your story and other two stories. You are actually talking about the same thing. It doesn't matter yeah. who you are, but basically something can happen to a Kurdish journalist and an artist. And the same thing is happening to you and Shabnam because you are actually touching the same thing. So three women, uh, it's, it's not yes. co coincidence, isn't it? That three women get together and the directors are, are women, you know, Italian. Yeah. And then how, how was it? How did they approach you? Why did you accept, you know, being a part of this film? Well, actually, I did not know how the film would turn out because they I was recently out of jail when they interviewed me. And uh, I was not in a very... I was very traumatized by prison. So I was not at my best, actually. And it's quite visible in the film. My eyes are a, are a bit empty. So they just wanted an interview, actually. I didn't know. Maybe they didn't at that time know the full film uh, okay. it was um, it started with an interview so yeah, you wasn't that's it. so you was you wasn't aware that it's going to be a documentary uh, i i knew it was going to be a documentary but precisely about what i didn't know and i think uh, when i watched it i was very impressed i really liked the film and um but, you know, certain parts it made me cry. These uh, these uh, scenes they have shot with uh, probably a cell phone yeah. of uh, these shootings and everything. 
it's an immensely powerful it, it, it film. Start, it starts with an animation, so it, yeah. it's very powerful. Yeah. So did, did, did you know Zehra Doan? I mean, did you have like personal connection with Zehra Doan and Shebnam? You know, I, I had the same film. I had met Shebnam before. We knew each other, but distantly. We ran into each other in demonstrations. Then uh, uh, once or twice we were in a big dinner, I think, all, all together, but not close friends. I I knew her and appreciated her and had a lot of respect for her work. Uh, read her column. Uh, apparently she had read my books, my column. So we, we, we knew each other. Zehra, at that time, I don't think I knew. I only knew her name. I knew her and I knew I knew her work, but as a person, no. I, I met her much later in Paris, actually, uh, a year ago or so. Uh, we had never met, actually, when the film was... Okay, uh, okay now that we, we are talking about, you know, the film and cinema, um, as I told earlier, this is a um, um, Kurdish film festival. So we are mm -hmm. celebrating our 20 years, you know, from London, but we have other 10, 10 partners. So we are doing a, a job that, you know, to unite Kurdish <laughs> film festivals and then globally show Kurdish cinema. We have two programs. So one of them is classic program that we have uh, films uh, from 2000 to 2018. And also we mm. have a package of um, Yilmaz Güney. We call him the mm. father of, you know, Kurdish uh, uh, cinema. Uh, if, uh, and we are broadcasting like four of his films, and one of them is Yol. Do you remember oh, yeah. anything anything about Yol that it oh, was? Yes. Actually, yeah, it was banned in Turkey, and also yeah. it earned the Pounder. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, it's a very beautiful what? film. It starts with the oh, especially it's now after prison. prison. Yeah, this prisoners coming out on a leave. Oh, it's one of the saddest films I've ever watched. And it's so, it really, I think, catches the geography, the Kurdish story with its full tragedy. I mean, I, I, it's really ha it's one of the films that has really moved me. Uh, I like his other, Umut, a bit more cinematographically. I, I like the simpler film, but Yol is, a, is an epic it's an epic film, I think. Uh, is um, do, do you remember the last last shot? It says Kurdistan, so it was banned oh, no, actually that's... for that. Yeah, oh, I now don't know. We, yeah, I do we have remember. Full, yeah, we have a full version, so we are broadcasting. Mm. You know the original film uh, from the producer, you know Eddie, and uh, so they will see that because it's been censored in Turkey, so you won't yeah. be seeing the full film. So it is censored. So, um, yeah, I mean, thinking about Yilmaz Güney, his films, you know, um, and also about Kurdish cinema, are you a good fan of, you know, cinema films? Do you follow? Do you watch films? And also, I, are you like, yeah. In okay, the guys. past, I was, uh, when I was in my 20s and 30s, I was really a festival or cinematic kind of person. Okay. Uh, but... Um, I had a um, major operation from my um, neck. Throat. Okay. Neck. Uh, and there's a prothes in my neck. So for a long time, like two or three years, I was not able to hold my neck long period. So films were banned. So then I started to lose the habit. Uh, and then came the pandemic and all this. So now I'm what in the last years I've really lost my grip on the cinema. Uh, so I, are you are you familiar with Kurdish cinema and Kurdish films? You know, especially from Bakur, you know, North Kurdistan, like Yilmaz Güney. There's Kazimers. There, there's you know there are lots of films that I can mention. I, I know Yilmaz Güney, Kazimers, and I I know also Bahman Gobadi. Bahman Gobadi. Yeah, from Iran. Yeah. Uh, I really liked his. Uh, he's, he's, I think, very in influenced by Yilmaz Güney. Um, but he, of course, like uh, like an amateur, I, I'm not really <laughs> an expert. 
I yeah. try to follow. Yeah. The reason that I'm asking, say, um, you know, literature writing is a form of art, and cinema is a form of art as well. So through cinema, we are trying to um, deliver, you know, Kurdish stories to a global audience. Uh, we have lots of, you know, um, classic films over 45, you know, this year, mm -hmm. you know, the show. So hopefully you can, you can get more familiar and watch films. Then you can have an idea. Maybe we can have another interview with you. And I will okay. ask your, your thoughts on that. And also okay. we, are, we, we are actually showing um, over 113 films, you know, all together. We have mm -hmm. a new, new, new film pro program as well. So your, the film that you acted is in a new program and also in, uh, in the competition, you know, feature competition. So we have mm -hmm. like eight, eight awards. So one of them is mm -hmm. Mehmet Aksoy uh, uh, feature film. So hopefully, I, I hope that you know you can get that. We don't know yet because the jury is uh, is not revealed yet. You know who won. So um, uh, thank you very much, Asta, for this thank lovely you. interview. Thank you. But before we finish, I do want to talk about the language. I left it this at the last minute because mm -hmm. I know uh, you know your native language. How important for us, you know, to actually. Mm -hmm dream in, in our language, you know, speak mm -hmm. our language, write in our languages. So how is it important to you? And from that, how can you utilize this, that Kurdish language is, is banned and people are not able to study, you know, their own languages? Well, I mean, uh, as I said, I'm not an ethnic Turk, uh, but I have Turkish as my native language. Uh, so I, I am a writer of Turkish. This is the only identity I carry. I, if they ask me, are you a Turk? I say no, but I am a writer of Turkish. I belong to that language uh, rather than I, I don't own it. I belong to it. And I lost some of my belonging, I think, when I was thrown into jail. The jail stole the language. It became the language of the police and the authority. So I kind I don't say I can fully understand, but I I do feel the pain of as a five year old child sent to uh, you know a Kurdish child going to a Turkish class and being slapped with his big Kurdish. These are very deep wounds, and uh, our languages, Circassian languages, most of them are extinct now because Turkey banned them. Along with Kurdish, Circassian was banned too, all the Circassian languages. Uh, and actually, it became free with Kurdish. <laughs> because of the Kurdish fight, we also <laughs> Circassian songs were allowed, but a bit so, too late. So we, we, we are in a way liberating as well, you know? Yes, other nations yes, actually, like yeah, actually. But those nations do not want that liberation, like lost people or something. They are more Turks than Turks. Uh, so I, I think it's a very open wound and to, to, I do support very much. For example, when my book, uh, The Stone Building, was translated in Kurdish, I, I got engaged in a project with the uh, publisher to give all the copyrights to sales to Kurdish prisoners who write in Kurdish, because I find it is the, the most important thing for Kurds to, to be able to exist in their own story is that they exist in their own language. You cannot really tell your story in English, in French. You'd have to do it in Kurdish. And then it will be translated to English and French and whatever. If they want to listen to you, they should get it from your language and translate it. And this is extremely important, I think, that the Kurds, although after an 80 year of silence or whatever, write their own story, write their own poem, write their own history, and make their own cinema. This is the basis of existence. Uh, I, I, I do my best to, if I can be of any support to Kurds trying to write in Kurdish, and you know, it's so difficult. It's free. 
in theory, but uh, there are people going still to in trouble because they sing in Kurdish. The economic difficulties are enormous. The prejudices are enormous. Uh, the Orientalism in Turkey, let's say, the West of Turkey really doesn't really uh, look carefully at what's coming out of there. Many, many enormous difficulties. Uh, and some... I mean, the, yeah, the least they do, they, they, they actually assimilate us. I was having an interview, you know, with one of the uh, TV, and then all of a sudden uh, I was asked, a Kurdish question, although I speak Kurdish and all of a sudden I forgot everything and I couldn't <laughs> speak. I said, I said, I'm going to answer you in Turkish. Do you understand? Do you yes. understand what they're doing to people? You know? Yes, I do understand. I do understand that it's a very big pain. I do understand, yeah. Yeah, most of my Kurdish friends are more comfortable in Turkish. Oh, so, I mean, Yeah. I mean, we, we don't we don't mind to speak another language now. We are talking in language. We yeah, have to communicate to each other. But this is happening to us too. Yeah, we are also communicating. But let's say it's a neutral language. It's not mine. It's not yours. So no. in that way, we <laughs> met on equal grounds. <laughs> That's um, why we, we want to carry out this Q&A in English, you know, for the global audience to understand us. And also we are equal, you know, We are women, we are equal, we understand each other. So for the unity of the woman, you know, to change and then to, to have peace, I think uh, there's a lot to be done. So I am grateful of your work and also your support to Kurdish people and Kurdish cinema and literature, you know, the support that actually you are open to it. And um, I congratulate you. So uh, I do like to ask you uh, lastly, if you are doing anything right now, Uh, any work that is going to be published or well, writing anything? I, last year I published a book of poetic prose in France. You know, I can't publish in Turkey. I'm, I have similar problems. <laughs> uh, and it, it made a very good impact on the French literary scene. The poetic prose, nobody wanted to publish. France did it. And, and now I, have, I promised to give them the second part of the book. The Requiem for a Lost City. Uh, so I will do my best. But as I said, my health problems and my psychological state is really keeping me from concentration. And I would like to finish with a, a sentence I learned in prison from okay. my, in Kurdish. But don't make fun of my accent. Oh, never. Jin Jian Azadeh. Oh, it's lovely. Xinjiang Azadi. You pronounce women, it very well. Women, life, freedom. Freedom. Always together. <laughs>